Known for its more romanticized depictions in various TV shows and movies, including the 1962 David Lean classic Lawrence of Arabia, the Arab Revolt of World War I, while considered to be a mere sideshow of the wider Arabian campaign against the Ottoman Empire, was in fact a major part of the British advance through the eastern Mediterranean with severe political consequences, ones that would reshape the region so fundamentally that its outcomes still resonate to this day. The Ottoman Empire, which had existed since around 1300 AD, held under its influence vast swathes of the Middle East, including, by the beginning of 1900, Palestine, Sinai, and colonies on the western and eastern shores of the Arabian Peninsula. Though despite their occupation, the Arab states under the control of the Ottomans had long held their desire for nationalism, initially through demands for reformation and a limited degree of autonomy, while allowing for a greater use of Arabic in education and changes in peacetime conscription in the Ottoman Empire so as to permit Arab conscripts local service in the Ottoman army, this peace being broken during the Young Turk Revolution of July 3, 1908, which spread rapidly through the empire and forced Sultan Abdul Hamid II to announce the restoration of the 1876 constitution and the reconvening of the Ottoman parliament, creating the second constitutional era, this new parliament including within its ranks representatives of all the various colonies held under the Ottoman banner, with the Arabian faction being the second largest represented people behind the Turks, with 60 members present. The newly elected Committee of Union and Progress, or CUP, however, had won on a ticket of promoting pan-Islamism, Ottomanism, and pan-Turkism, but were fundamentally a Turkish nationalist group who wished to see sole domination of Turkish ideals across the empire, which ultimately proved to antagonize the Arab leaders and thus revive their own desires for nationalism, Arab members of the parliament supporting a subsequent counter-coup in 1909, which aimed to dismantle the constitutional system and restore the absolute monarchy of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the dethroned sultan attempting to restore the Ottoman caliphate by putting an end to the secular policies of the CUP, but was, in the end, driven into exile by the 31st of March incident, during which the counter-coup was defeated, and Abdul Hamid's brother, Mehmed V, was placed on the throne, the defeat of the 1909 counter-coup serving only to stoke continued dissent among the Arab factions, leading, in 1913, to intellectuals and politicians from the Mashriq meeting in Paris at the First Arab Congress, bringing with them a list of demands that included greater autonomy and equality within the Ottoman Empire including for elementary and secondary education in Arab lands to be delivered in Arabic, for peacetime Arab conscripts to the Ottoman army to serve near their home region, and for at least three Arab ministers in the Ottoman cabinet. On August 2, 1914, shortly after the declaration of World War I between the central powers of the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Triple Entente of France, Russia and Great Britain, the Germans signed a pact with the Ottoman Empire dubbed the Germany-Ottoman Alliance, a cooperation essential for the CUP as even before the outbreak of war, the Ottomans had been an empire generally considered in decline due to the internal squabbling of its new Young Turk leadership, the biggest sign of their outdated tactics and military being during the First Balkan War of 1912-1913, during which the Balkan League of Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia and Montenegro scored a decisive victory against their Turkish overlords, losing them 83% of their European territories and 69% of their European population while at the same time having lost control of Egypt, Libya and Tunisia throughout the preceding decades. The alliance proposing that far more advanced German weapons and equipment be provided to strengthen and modernise the Ottomans in exchange for German forces being allowed safe passage into the neighbouring British colonies of the Middle East, leading ultimately to the Ottoman Empire entering the war on October 29th when they bombarded the Russian ports on the Black Sea. With the Arab population essentially being rendered second-class citizens within the Ottoman Empire, and their cries for nationalism now subdued by the ruling CUP, it became readily apparent to the British in Egypt that the Arab forces could provide vital support for their upcoming campaign against the Turks in the Middle East, while also fearing the possibility that, if the Arabs took side with their Ottoman masters, they could easily cut off lines of shipping and communication between Britain and her colonies of the Middle and Far East by way of capturing the Suez Canal. Herbert Kitchener, Consul General of Egypt and recently appointed Secretary of War, opening correspondence with Sharif Hussein bin Ali, Emir of Mecca and head of the Hashemite dynasty from November 1st, 1914, during which he stated that Great Britain would, in exchange for support from the Arabs of Hejaz, the western regions of the Arabian Peninsula, guarantee the independence, rights and privileges of the Sharifate against all foreign external aggression, in particular that of the Ottomans. While politics was a strong factor behind the divisions between the Turkish Ottomans and the Arabs, religion was another hugely important motivation for the upcoming conflict. The Ottoman Sultan being the Caliph, or head of Islam, yet Sharif Hussein bin Ali was Emir of Mecca, and therefore ruler of the holiest site in Islam, 
any potential breakaway of the Arab states from the wider Ottoman Empire being seen with great fear by the Sultan and CUP, as losing control of Mecca would be a blow to their centuries-old tradition as leader and protector of Islam, while at the same time presenting the possibility of losing the Ottomans' control of the vital Hejaz railway, which had opened in 1908 and ran between Damascus, Amman and Medina, and thus allowed not only for the quick and safe transportation of pilgrims to Mecca, but also provided a valuable supply route for the Turks in their campaign against the British, and thus could not be surrendered under any circumstances. Though in their desire to quash any signs of nationalist sentiment among the Arabs, and thus keep them within their sphere of influence, this only served to exacerbate resentment and push Hussein more towards the British as a potential ally against their antagonistic masters. Therefore, negotiations formally began between the British and the Hashemites, with Sir Henry McMahon, High Commissioner of Egypt, agreeing to recognize and support the independence of the Arabs in all the regions within the limits demanded by the Sharif of Mecca, but excluded the Gulf states as these were already part of the British Empire, while also demanding special administrative arrangements in the Ottoman vilayets of Basra and Baghdad in Mesopotamia, Sharif Hussein negotiating time limits to British control in Syria and Mesopotamia before concluding the agreement in March 1916, Hussein being unaware that, at the same time, the factions of the Triple Entente was also preparing their own plans for the carving up of the Ottoman Empire among themselves once victory had been assured over the Turks, a secret treaty being drafted during late 1915 that came to pass on May 16, 1916 as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, so named after French diplomat François-Georges Picot and British politician Colonel Sir Tatton Benvenuto Marx Sykes, the latter of whom had also designed the colour scheme of the Arab flag of resistance. The Sykes-Picot Agreement effectively divided the Ottoman provinces outside the Arabian Peninsula into areas of British and French control and influence, the divisions of which would be defined by the Sykes-Picot Line that ran between the Mediterranean at Accra and the Kandil Mountains of what is now northeastern Iraq and Kurdistan, the agreement allocating to the British Empire control of what is today southern Israel and Palestine, Jordan and southern Iraq, as well as an additional small area that included the ports of Haifa and Accra to allow access to the Mediterranean while France was granted control of southeastern Turkey, the Kurdistan region, Syria and Lebanon. The drafting of two concurrent secret treaties in the form of both the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the hussein mcmahon Agreements being seen very much as the British and French powers hedging their bets by preparing for a post-war future that was not yet guaranteed by victory over the Ottomans, while at the same time seeking support in the present so as to win the war already being fought. Knowing full well that, despite the outcomes, neither Britain nor France could possibly honour all of their promises, especially to the Arabs, leading to what was considered, even at the time, as a controversial exercise in double dealing. Ultimately, the factor that drove Hussein fully into support of the British, after years of harsh oppression against Arab nationalism, came during 1915, when Ottoman forces rounded up 50,000 Arab civilians in Damascus and Beirut, who were suspected of having nationalist leanings, and exiled them to Anatolia the main Turkish homeland to the north, while the nationalist leaders themselves were arrested and brutally tortured, the removal of so many people, most of whom were farmers, leading to a disastrous loss of agriculture, which, in combination with a plague of locusts that ruined crops between the summers of 1915 and 1916, together with a requisitioning of those food supplies remaining in order to feed the Ottoman army, led to a devastating famine that saw 500,000 people starve to death by 1918. This being compounded further by the blockading of Syria's Mediterranean ports by the Royal Navy that cut off any means of humanitarian aid reaching the area. Thus, Hussein ultimately chose to support the British, and on June 10, 1916, one symbolic shot was fired at the Ottoman garrison in Mecca, heralding the start of the Arab Revolt, their campaign seeing huge initial success in the Hejaz region, as by September the Arabs, as assisted by Bedouin horsemen and British naval and air support, had taken the Red Sea ports of Jeddah, Rabig, and Yembo, while Mecca and Taif were also captured, with 6,000 Ottoman troops taken prisoner, Sharif Hussein proclaiming himself King of the Arabs and appointing his sons as emirs, though these early victories would not carry through for the remainder of the year, one early disappointment being that Arab officers and men in the Ottoman army did not break rank and join the side of Sharif Hussein, remaining loyal to their Turkish masters and essentially forcing the Arabs to fight their own people the revolt also being condemned across the wider Muslim world, especially in India, where the All Indian Muslim League passed a resolution opposing the actions of Sharif Hussein and called for a jihad against him. Out in the field, the initial slew of victories rapidly waned, the Bedouin tribesmen struggling to keep control of their captured cities once the early excitement of their conquest had abated and was soon slipping back into the desert. 
the British being reluctant to send troops to join the Arab ranks, especially those of the Indian Muslim regiments, who had opposed the Arab revolt entirely. Their solution, in response to an Ottoman counterattack being planned during August 1916, being to recruit Ottoman Arab nationalists held in British prisoner of war camps in Egypt and Mesopotamia, forming a corps of regular soldiers alongside thousands of irregular units, comprised mostly of camel and horse-mounted cavalry. The eventual number of regular units in the Arab revolt being disappointing due to the very transitory nature of their campaign, with tribes and warriors fighting against the Turks more as a means of seeking individual glory by way of booty, thus forcing the British to take the risk of potential descent and dispatch 960 Muslim Egyptian gunners against their will to the Hejaz, though their reluctance to back a cause they had opposed on principle meant their effectiveness was minimal, requiring yet another new strategy by the British. In October 1916, Thomas Edward or T. E. Lawrence, an intelligence officer who spoke fluent Arabic and was well accustomed to living in the desert due to his pre-war archaeology trips in Syria, was sent to the Hejaz to meet Sharif Hussein's third son, the Emir Faisal, Lawrence immediately noting the disorganized and demoralized Arab force that could do little against the technological might of the rapidly regrouping Ottomans. Lawrence concluding that the only way to ensure a consistent force within the Arab revolt was to replace shipments of British regulars with gold, thereby paying for what was essentially a guerrilla army, while also supporting the Arabs through technical advice and air support. Lawrence's recommendations coming not a moment too late, as in December 1916 the Ottomans unleashed their counterattack and forced the Arabs back to the port of Yembo, though the extent to which the Turks could press home their advantage was limited by the fact that they had only the Hejaz railway as a means of supply, this single strip of steel in the vast desert being extremely vulnerable to attacks by the Bedouin tribesmen, as led by Lawrence, and supported by British planes thus curtailing the Ottoman advance and forcing them to retreat back to the north. In the south, 10,000 Ottoman troops remained isolated in Medina, though with their supply lines cut off through the raiding of Ottoman outposts and destruction along the Hejaz railway, meant this pocket of enemy units posed no significant threat to the wider Arab revolt, Lawrence and the Bedouin tribesmen gradually forcing their way north along the Red Sea coast with the support of British naval and air power the UK government having expended, by the end of 1916, one million pounds worth of British gold, or 70.1 million pounds in 2023, control of the Hejaz region being secured by the new year, and thus meant the Arab revolt could be amalgamated into the wider Palestine campaign that sought to unseat the Turks from their positions in Jordan, Palestine, Syria and Lebanon. The Arabs harrying the Ottoman army from the east, while the main Egyptian expeditionary force drove up along the Mediterranean coast from the west. This not being the original intention of the British planners in Cairo, but due to the huge success of the Bedouin tribesmen in Hejaz, it meant that the enemy was forced to defend against two separate fronts, command of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force being handed to General Edmund Allenby on June 27, 1917, who was tasked with forcing the Turks north and capturing the holy city of Jerusalem, an objective successfully accomplished before Christmas of that year and led to a huge boost in morale for British forces. Elsewhere, the British continued to supply the Arab army, issuing 30,000 rifles with 15 million rounds of ammunition, Rolls-Royce armoured cars, grain and food stocks, and most importantly of all, gold for payment, while landing strips were built across the desert so as to allow the Royal Flying Corps the ability to pound the Hejaz railway, a thorn in the side of the Arab advance being the port of Aqaba on the border with Palestine, which guarded the Gulf of Aqaba between the Sinai and Arabian peninsulas with a heavy naval defence, though on the landward side, the Ottomans, not expecting the approach of an enemy from the rear, had left the port conspicuously undefended. Lawrence, with a force of 5,000 men, that included the famous Hawitat tribe of Sheikh Aouda Abu Taya, among the finest warriors of the Arab revolt, attacking Aqaba and capturing it with the assistance of Royal Navy vessels out in the Gulf, meaning the entire Red Sea was now under Allied control and could be supplied with ease. The accord struck between the Arabs and the British, however, was rumbled in November 1917, following the October Revolution in Russia, when Bolshevik factions rose up and overthrew the Tsarist government before removing the nation from its calamitous campaign against the Germans on the Eastern Front. The Bolsheviks, so as to discredit the Tsar's regime, releasing details of the Sykes-Picot Agreement to the world, and thus making it public that the British and French had double-dealt the Arabs, the Ottomans attempting to use this as a means of setting the Arabs against their new British masters, and thereby disrupt the Middle Eastern campaign. Though while an infuriated Sharif Hussein demanded an explanation, there was little he could do but maintain ties with the British, as their combined efforts had essentially rid the Arabian Peninsula and large swathes of Palestine of the Ottomans. The winter of 1917 to 1918, seeing the Arab army move north along the line of the Hejaz Railway, avoiding the well-defended Turkish position at Ma'an. Though any strategic advances hoped for by Lawrence and his Bedouin tribesmen 
did little against the well-disciplined Ottoman army, and thus slowed their progress to a crawl, while Allenby, in the face of the German spring offensive on the Western Front, was ordered to send 60,000 of his troops back to Europe, bringing the invasion of Palestine to a halt. In September 1918, after months of stalemate, Allenby adopted a new strategy to convince the Ottomans that their main thrust north into Palestine would come from the Arab army to the east of the River Jordan, sending cavalry groups to the desert, where they moved north by day and then fell back at night, before moving north the next day to give the impression of a building force, bridges across rivers being constructed, false radio signals being issued, and 15,000 model horses made of canvas and wood being assembled to draw as much of the Turkish army away to the east. Allenby's deception working wonders, as on September 19, 1918, his Egyptian expeditionary force launched a surprise attack on the port city of Jaffa that completely routed the unprepared Ottoman troops, the confusion and disarray caused by Allenby's sudden advance to the west causing the Turks to retreat without being able to establish proper fortifications or defences. In the east, Lawrence and his Arab army continued north along the course of the Hejaz Railway, and thus provided a continued diversion for the withdrawing Ottoman army, though as the Arabs gained confidence in their ability to break their former Turkish masters, massacres and atrocities soon followed, as was the case with the Tafas massacre of September 27, 1918, when following the destruction of the namesake Syrian town by the retreating Ottoman forces so as to break the morale of the advancing British and Arabs, Lawrence let loose his enraged followers on the Turkish column in some of the most brutal violence of the Middle Eastern campaign, with upwards of 250 men, including Austrian and German troops, being summarily executed to a man, much to Lawrence's everlasting shame. Ultimately, the British and Arab forces arrived in Damascus on October 1st, 1918, following their decisive victory at the Battle of Megiddo in the Judean Hills a week prior, during which 26,000 Ottomans had been killed against 782 of the Allied forces the Ottomans finally surrendering with the signing of the Armistice of Mudros on October 30th, with Istanbul being occupied by combined British, French, Italian and Greek forces. Though in spite of the efforts of the Arab army and their hopes of independence from the colonial powers after the end of the war, all their hopes were dashed as Britain and France moved to secure their own interests in the Middle East, Allenby informing Faisal Hussein that the British would control Palestine and Mesopotamia, while the French would control Lebanon, all Arab lands thus being allocated to the control of the Allied Occupied Enemy Territory Administration, with the British and French governing through a system of mandates that would provide temporary administration for a period before representative national governments took over. The outcomes of this caused bitter resentment among the Arabs, who demanded independent states in Syria and the Hejaz, while Faisal Hussein established himself in Damascus as King of Syria until the French dispatched a force of colonial troops that had him unseated and banished into exile. His father, Sharif Hussein, remaining as king of the Hejaz, but refused to have anything further to do with the British. The power vacuum left by the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, eventually leading to the House of Saud, the descendants of Mohammed bin Saud, who had formed the Emirate of Daria that occupied large portions of the Arabian Peninsula, to occupy the Hejaz region from 1925, thus leading to the creation of a new power in the Middle East as the unified kingdom of Saudi Arabia, following unification on September 23, 1932 while Faisal and his brother Abdullah were eventually installed as kings of Iraq and Transjordan respectively, but these were nominal roles only, as the British ruled these countries under the mandate system. The outcomes of the sykes pico Agreement, which clumsily carved up the Arab states in a manner seen only fit by the colonial powers, leading to an air of pervasive distrust against the West, as well as vicious and bloody internal conflicts as tribal factions vie for power that continues to permeate to this day.